Good afternoon, everyone. So refreshing to see you in person. Normally you would say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, because you will be addressing a Zoom conversation with people from around the world. But uh, I, I can say good afternoon to you all. Excellency, uh, dear colleague uh, uh, Tatiana Valovaya, uh, distinguished uh, participants in this very important meeting, it gives me great pleasure to uh, be introducing what for us a few months ago was a dream, but uh, has rapidly become reality. This uh, first uh, Science Diplomacy uh, Week Open Forum uh, that is intended to test the waters to s see whether the, uh, v uh, our proposition that uh, diplomacy and uh, science can come together and work for the benefit of mankind is something that we can validate. So uh, thank you all for being here uh, this uh, afternoon. Uh, as uh, the diplomacy uh, co-chair of the coalition on science and uh, anticipatory uh, diplomacy. It really gives me great pleasure, and I would like to recognize my co-chair, academic co-chair, Marga Guala Soler, with whom we have been working with a coalition of some 14 agencies and organizations, uh, Geneva-based, in order to put together this week, and uh, we welcome the uh, participants from around the world, I do understand that you come from all five continents, and uh, you are, uh, I would say, the uh, guinea pigs of our our project. And we we hope that we can, uh, you can help us validate our uh, proposition. We do have uh, an opening uh, ceremony uh, whereby we would ask uh, my colleague, uh, the Director General of the UN Office in Geneva. Uh, Ms. Uh, Tatiana Valovaya to address you. And let me thank you, Tatiana, for making available these uh, wonderful premises. For many of us, it's the first time in two years that we're setting foot on these premises, and uh, it's so refreshing. So uh, may I now ask you to deliver your opening remarks, uh, uh, Tatiana? Good afternoon, excellencies, dear colleagues, dear friends. It's really a, a real pleasure to have you here in person in this beautiful place, a very symbolic place. And for us, it's really a great honor here in the United Nations, in this building of library and archives, to go on with the tradition, long-standing tradition, which always existed in these walls, to share the knowledge, to go on with open and very transparent discussions, to look for solutions, and really to build up multilateral system. I'm always saying that I'm really humbled by the wisdom of our ancestors. Ancestors who, after the First World War, after terrible pandemic of Spanish flu, not only have created the first multilateral organization, League of Nations, but also decided to invest into physical vision for this multilateral world, this fantastic Palais de Nation. And for us, it's really a great opportunity to build up on this history of multilateralism and to talk here about the future. And really, when we are talking about future, quite often we mostly think about current crisis. And yes, we are now in the most difficult, the most challenging period of the life of the humanity since the Second World War. We have so many crises all around us, war, military conflicts, geopolitical tensions, global mistrust, climate change, growth in poverty, the risk of hunger in many parts of the world. You can continue this very long list. But at the same time, we are living in a period of fantastic scientific and technological opportunities. We all know about the possibilities of such important 
uh, discoveries which we can uh, find in all spheres of science, artificial intelligence, robotics, bio and climate engineering, many, many others. But of course, the key, uh, the key uh, challenge today is not just to see that there is this scientific and technological uh, 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 progress, but to channel it in the way which would provide benefit to the whole humanity. That the result of these scientific and technological discoveries will be the better life for all. That the, it will be the implementation of sustainable development goals. It will be increasing human rights all around the world. Giving opportunities to everybody irrespective of uh, where this person is living in which part of the world to have access to knowledge, to have access to education, and to have uh, access to better life. So it's very, very important this day to understand how to channel these scientific discoveries. And when Secretary General presented his uh, strategy on technological development in 2018, he made very many important uh, points in this strategy. For example, that we really should think not about technologies not as technology per se, but about what this technology could provide for the benefit of the world high. How we should strengthen and reinforce existing regulations and sometimes create new regulations in order exactly to avoid negative consequences of the new uh, technologies. And, of course, how we could use these uh, technologies into multi-stakeholders world. And when we're thinking about all these dimensions, of course, you can't find a better place to have this exercise but Geneva. Geneva is a fantastic ecosystem where all key international actors are present. The governments, of course, in the... Uh, international organizations, regional organizations, non-governmental organizations, private sector, universities. So really, we have lots of great months here together. And of course, we do have experience of working together in the International Geneva. I can just remind you the project, uh, Perception Change Project, which was uh, launched exactly to move forward to the idea of International Geneva and the possibilities of this ecosystem. So I think this week could really give us a new vision how we can really combine diplomatic possibilities of Geneva with its scientific possibilities, how we really can work together in a very solid way to have the better future for all and to avoid some challenging consequences of these technologies. Once again, I understand it's the first edition. We are all here guinea pigs. And as a result of this meeting, there will be lots of food of thought. But I personally believe that exactly it's high time how we can perceive the technological and scientific challenges, how we can understand what are their possible consequences, both positive and negative for the humankind, and how can we work together to establish a necessary multilateral framework exactly to channel this uh, development in the um, uh, aim of implementing sustainable development goals, of leaving nobody behind, and to have a peace and prosperity for all the humanity. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much, Tatiana, for those uh, very inspiring uh, remarks. Uh, we feel heartened that uh, you begin to validate the importance of dialogue between the various communities in order to allow us to uh, better address the challenges that uh, mankind is facing today. The future is today, not only tomorrow, so we need to be uh, well prepared. And thank you very much for your comments. Let me now invite uh, uh, Mr. Peter Brabeck uh, Lemat. Uh, the boss, <laughs> I'm told, uh, he is chair of uh, JASDA, and it is on the, under the umbrella of uh, JASDA that we're organizing this uh, uh, week on science uh, diplomacy. Uh, Peter, you have the floor. Well, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, 
First of all, I would join and thank Tatiana for this encouraging speech which you gave us. It was really full of optimism in a very difficult time. And I think optimism we need if you want to achieve what was at the beginning of this uh, event that we are celebrating and are opening today. And it is a real uh, honor and a pleasure for me to open this uh, week here of Science Diplomacy in Geneva. I would also like to thank uh, our friend Francesco Pisano, the director of the UN Library and Archives, for inviting us uh, to officially start the week in this place, which is a historical place. And I'm sure you had time to see a little bit. Not only the books are historical, but there are some very nice paintings and photos of historical events. So I feel very honored that we are allowed to open this uh, week here in this building. I think this week gives us an opportunity to offer, first of all, an immersion training uh, in science diplomacy to 30 participants from 20 countries. And uh, we had to select you one by one because we had over 130 applicants. So you are a very selected group. Uh, and uh, I think this shows that when we saw the 130 applicants, it shows of this growing interest uh, worldwide in science diplomacy. So the week has really two complementary uh, components, if you want. The first one is, as I mentioned, an intensive uh, immersive course, which has been developed uh, together with the UNITA, the UN Institute for Training and Research, and JESTA. And the second one, uh, which is as important as the first one, at least for us, is uh, an open public forum, which is set up with the Graduate Institute of International Development at International and Development Studies, whose purpose is to include in the discussion 1,000 people. And I think it was mentioned by uh, Tatiana before, uh, Geneva is a unique place to do this because we have representative of every uh, part of society here. So we want to, to in Geneva, uh, where we are at the intersection of diplomacy, science, entrepreneurship, and NGOs, don't let's forget the civil societies. So I therefore welcome the 30 participants through the course, but also welcome the more than 1,000 people we expect during this week to be in the open forum. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is perhaps worthwhile remembering that the right to benefit from scientific progress is enshrined in Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's not something we have invented just now. It has been in the Declaration of Human Rights from the very beginning. And in this field, the international community is faced, I would say, with at least three major challenges. The first one is to cope with this acceleration of scientific and technological development. The second one is to face a complexity of global challenges and accelerate the implementation of the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which I think is a wonderful framework that has been given to all of us in order to channel our efforts, our common efforts, to achieve these uh, sustainable development goals. And the third one is to navigate the latest geopolitical challenges, which were all already mentioned by Tatiana, and make sure they do not diminish the spirit of collaboration and partnership, which is absolutely necessary for the scientific development on the one hand side and its availability to the greatest number of people around the world. There is a great risk in today's world, at least from my perspective, uh, that we will, for some time at least, be reliving this zero-sum game between states that the older among us, not among you, have been experiencing after the Second World War. The Cold War was basically a war between, on the, based on the zero-sum. One has to lose, one has to win, when the reality is that everybody has to win. So we have to overcome this. It seems when you look at the medias today, it seems we are back to this zero sum. There are winners and losers, 
and basically they are all losers and no winners. Uh, we have to turn this around to get again winners. In this travel context, our week offers an opportunity, I hope, for continuing education and exchanges on science diplomacy with 21 Geneva, Swiss and international institutions. And why does it matter? Why does it matter just now? First of all, it is important to pull all of our academic, diplomatic, entrepreneurial and civil capabilities to ensure that we rise to these global challenges of today's world. But Jana already mentioned, I mean, it's not only the war in Ukraine. There are so many other, I mean, we have, we have uh, the wars we're coming out of the world for Syria, coming out is too much to say. You look around the world, it's full of wars, and news are just arriving by now. We have the pandemic, of course. So we have many challenges today. And this is particularly true if we want to prevent the concentration of scientific and technology development in a limited number of countries or private companies. I think this is one of the biggest challenges that we have. If uh, we take quantum computing, we could envisage that at the end of the day, quantum computing, which is going to have an immense impact on all of us, is going to be concentrated in the hand of perhaps three multinational companies in four countries. Is that good for the future? Are we going to have the next discussion like we have today about some social media concerns? If we had thought about this before, we wouldn't have to have this discussion now. We need to ensure that scientific and technological developments are accessible to, and perhaps much better, are really co-developed by as many people as possible. That's why I said the open forum with the 1,000 participants is as important as this is immersion program that we have. And secondly, the role of science in diplomacy is increasing day by day. The challenge of science diplomacy is therefore to improve the early collective intelligence on scientific development and to develop methods to do something with it. And for this, we have to take advantage of the opportunities of scientific disruptions as quickly as possible. The more we can anticipate, the more we can create the framework which allows to take advantage of those disruptions. And this is exactly what the 21 partners of this first edition of this week of scientific diplomacy are doing. And I would like to thank all 21 partners to join forces in pooling their resources with us. Bringing you all together during this week is for the very young Chester Foundation the best way to recognize the richness of international Geneva in terms of science diplomacy. Indeed, if you think about it, the University of Geneva with its founder, Jean Calvin, the International Committee of the Red Cross, the International Telecommunication Union, the World Meteorological Organization, UNITAR, the Graduate Institute, CERN, to take just a few examples, all of those have anchored science diplomacy in Geneva. We, Chester, the young foundation less than three years old, now want to make our contribution. And we want to do it by building on this rich tradition of science diplomacy in Geneva, by building together the first global science diplomacy curriculum, which, as you were mentioned, we are the big kids, by making the Chester Science Breaks Rurara available to the international community as a training tool, and by training the future ambassadors of science diplomacy. I would like to conclude by thanking two foundations that are making this first edition of Science Diplomacy Week in Geneva possible. One is La Fondation Bois Genève, and the other one is the Asuera Foundation of Stefan schmidt Heinis family. By thanking them, I wish you a fruitful Science Diplomacy Week. I wish all of us a very fruitful open forum, and I thank you for your enthusiasm and interest. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon, Your Excellencies, dear friends, dear colleagues, uh, dear members of the Immersion Programme, dear participants in the Immersion Programme. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to be able to say a few words on this opening session of the Science and Diplomacy Week on behalf of the Geneva Graduate Institute. Madame Directeur Générale, dear Tatiana, thank you so much for uh, welcoming us in the Palais des Nations. That it had been said already, but I want to say it again, symbolizes so well the spirit of collaboration for progress, a spirit that we've never been so much in need of championing, reaffirming, and fighting for. And dear Francesco, thank you so much for welcoming us in this beautiful room, which I personally I didn't know, so it's my first time here. I'm very happy to be here. Let's, let me say how happy we are at the Institute to have uh, co-facilitated uh, the open forum part of the first Science and Diplomacy Week. Let me say also how committed we are to our collaboration with GESDA and with so many other partners that are all represented here today. As some of you may know, the Institute has a long history with the co-organization of weeks on many different topics on peace, trade, democracy, health, etc. And these weeks always involve a multiplicity of partners willing to engage, to explore and learn from each other through intense discussions and interactions, something that probably you all also will uh, benefit from. Every year, participants to those intense weeks go back, recharged with ideas, with motivation and the desire to collaborate even further. I'm naturally convinced that this will be the case also at the end of this week. Let me actually take the opportunity here to express a huge thank you to Hakim Venman, who's over there, who has been the pivotal actor on our side, working together with the GESDA team and all other partners so that the open forum part of this week could materialize. Let me say also a few words on why we were particularly interested at the Institute by the open forum part of the Science and Diplomacy Week. Beyond the immersion program, which has, uh, has been mentioned by Peter right now, has obviously a very important role to play. Our discussions on science and diplomacy need also to reach well beyond specialists and already convinced experts. Science has never been as powerful as it is today, and at the same time, it has never been as contested and as questioned. As to diplomacy, it's never been as necessary and important and nevertheless as fragilized. So explaining to a very broad public what both science and diplomacy are, how they may relate together or be connected in productive ways and how all this matters furthermore to the everyday life of all of us, of citizens across the world, to the future of our children is definitely something that is of the utmost importance. This broad pedagogical responsibility is something that talks to us and to all university representatives present in this room uh, in a kind of natural way, but it has also been an important defining agenda for GESDA ever since its creation. Technology, and in particular the contemporary digital turn, has potentially existential consequences for all of us. These existential consequences can be positive, as when technology, it's been mentioned already, is or will be helping us to address and to respond to major current challenges, climate change, pandemics, depletion of key natural resources, pollution of our seas, etc. But these existential consequences can also be profoundly dystopic and destructive, as has already been mentioned too. I'm here talking beyond the obvious and relatively simple case of the military use of those technologies for traditional or for cyber wars. I'm also thinking about the fragilization of our democracies that the digital turn in its current form appears to be accelerating. I'm thinking also about the destruction of our social connections, that strangely enough, our virtual connectivity appears to be pushing along with the disastrous consequences of what one could call structural loneliness. I'm also thinking about the possible end of work, as we know it, at least, which in the current structuring of our socio-economic system means further increasing inequalities, meaninglessness, and despair, which we know generally leads to violence. Yuval Harari talks in this context of the emergence of a useless class, but when this class represents a large majority of our economies and societies, then we have a major problem indeed. 
I'm finally also thinking of an even more radical way in which this technological turn can have a dystopic impact on our human species by targeting a post-human or transhuman future by essentially moving to overcome those weaknesses of our species, creativity, and um, it, it, uh, there's naturally the danger of killing in the process the sources of our species' creativity and innovation, of our resilience and capacity to adapt. But there's also the risk of killing what is the salt of humanity, the source of meaning in our lives, our connection to nature, the source of the, the, the empathy and the need of others, and our acknowledgement of vanitas, that is a healthy consequence of our mortality and of the consciousness that we gain from it as we age, but also of our capacity to create and to love, both of which enchant and give sense to our lives. This is what I like to call, as a number of you know by now, the tech or the digital genus, the best, the extreme best on the one hand and some of the most dangerous trends on the other. You can see from what I just underscored how important is the role of a transdisciplinary social science perspective on those tech questions. This is why at the Geneva Graduate Institute, we are making this tech turn one of our important strategic foci for the coming years. We formally launched last week our tech hub, which in the coming weeks should actually have a bit of a better, a better name, should give itself a better name than that. The Tech Hub is a transdisciplinary and horizontal initiative where the Geneva Graduate Institute will forge and will express its own unique voice on the digital shift and its consequences. It brings together many members of our community who work on those issues, and it will progressively structure different kinds of activities as well as welcome and foster different kinds of research projects. More on that will follow. In that context, our links with JESDA and many of the partners to the Science and Diplomacy Week are extremely important to us and will hopefully be deepened further through that um, uh, new development at the Institute. Something we are profoundly convinced of is the inescapable interdependence of our global current predicament. The challenges that face us are broadly shared and there will be no solution without the acknowledgement of this interdependence and the reaffirmation of structured forms of collaboration, as Tatiana has mentioned in her own speech. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish all of us very productive and very rich debates this week. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marie-Laure. Very insightful indeed, uh, those comments. And uh, I think the stage has been well set for what I think will be very uh, fruitful deliberations over the coming week. And uh, uh, we, uh, the case has been made by the three speakers for the need for us to be able to anticipate what is likely to happen to us uh, in the future in order to uh, better uh, address those challenges. And so uh, I believe the participants have their work cut out for them. And uh, we will now go on to the uh, first uh, high level round table of this event uh, this week. And uh, uh, I'm so excited because we have uh, such a wonderful panel array of uh, experts and uh, experienced people who are going to help us reflect on uh, the theme which is taking the pulse of uh, uh, science diplomacy in international Geneva. And when we talk of international Geneva, I think we're talking of the world. The previous speakers have all made the point that uh, Geneva is the hub of multilateralism. And so what happens here has ramifications uh, for the rest of the world, or what is discussed here is validated by what is happening in the rest of the world. So we can really talk of taking the pulse of science diplomacy in the world as a whole. So uh, I would like to invite to the stage uh, Dr. Christian Allen, uh, Ambassador Thomas uh, Greminga, Professor Jovan Kubalia and Dr. Christian Sim. And uh, 
I would also like to invite my co-moderator for this session, uh, Dr. Amaga Gual Soler, uh, to come here. Uh, we're looking forward to your uh, steering the deliberations of this uh, uh, introductory high-level roundtable. Please, over to you, Maga. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome uh, to our participants of the Science Diplomacy Immersion Week. Uh, thank you so much, Madame Balovaya, for this wonderful hosting in the United Nations. This is very special for all of us. As a co-chair of the Geneva Coalition on Science and Diplomacy together with Martin, we have been working for almost a year to bring you this event today. And we are so excited to bring all of the coalition members that have been working very hard to bring us the content and the discussions that we're going to have this week. And we didn't want to pass the opportunity to hear from all of them. You have heard already three uh, uh, very thought-provoking uh, inputs. And what we want to do now is more in a, in a conversation uh, uh, style, I think, to hear from uh, four key coalition members that, as I say, have been uh, very uh, generous with their time and expertise to put together from their perspectives what they think the future of science and diplomacy will be in their respective fields. Uh, so, without further ado, I want to introduce them and then I'll have a question for each of them. So you can uh, start uh, with the opening uh, input and contribution. First, we will have uh, Dr. Christine Allen. She's the Executive Secretary of International Network for Government Science Advice, INSA, one of the institutions that has been thinking about science diplomacy, working on science diplomacy for many, many, many years. And so we wanted to start with you, Christian, because you have seen the shift of science diplomacy uh, with the pandemic, now the new geopolitical reality. And we wanted to just uh, for you to give us uh, taking the pulse and taking stock of science diplomacy, past, present, and future to set the stage for the, other, for the rest of our panelists. So let's start with you, Christian. Well, thank you very much. The microphone is on, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much, um, Marga. And it's a real delight to be here, excellencies, um, esteemed colleagues, and dear friends. Um, what a wonderful gathering this is and will be this week. Tout d'abord, je devrais bien commencer à vous amener bien les salutations et bien sûr les félicitations. Félicitations de la part de professeur Rémi Kérion, euh, le scientifique en chef euh, du Québec, mais aussi récemment devenu le président euh, de l'INSA. Il était très déçu de ne pas pouvoir être parmi vous aujourd'hui, euh, mais euh, il, il pense à vous et euh, il vous souhaite euh, les meilleurs voeux pour ses réflex vos ré réflexions cette semaine et euh, votre apprentissage qui sera bien sûr intensif. Um, I think when INSA began in 2014 uh, at a meeting of the then uh, ICSU, now uh, ISC, the International Science Council in Auckland, New Zealand, the discourse around science advice to governments, let alone science diplomacy, felt very new and um, unformed um, and certainly not uh, a global discourse at the time. Um, so it was a very exciting time. It was a time of um, a lot of energy. It still is. Um, but we knew that something was needed. It was a turning point. Um, the MDGs were turning into the SDGs. Um, we were heading on a road to Paris. Uh, all of these buzzwords were circulating. And there was a need to unify and to think about a discourse and a common language, um, which didn't which was only just beginning at the time. And so INSA brought together uh, a community of practice and a community of like minds of people working at the interface between science and public policy, um, mostly in their own governments at the, at the national level. Uh, and those like minds coming together at an international and a global level 
really then started to create this discourse. And over the years, that science advice to government um, began to develop and also understand the interconnectedness, not just across policy domains, but across uh, international, uh, national borders into the international sphere and the multilateral sphere. And so I think observing how science advice to national governments has also complemented and grown with uh, science diplomacy is, is, is something important that we should take note of because what is happening in national governments is very contextualized. And once that comes to international and multilateral relations, those contexts really do matter. And I think that's something that we will very likely discuss and get into uh, quite deeply this week in our work. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to it. Thank you very much, Christian. <coughs> Uh, let's, following on that uh, last point that you made, let's turn to Ambassador Greminger to, to talk to us about this growing security and strategic dimensions of science and technology. And how do you see science diplomacy evolving from the um, Geneva uh, Center for Security Policy, which you direct? Well, thank you very much, uh, Marka, and uh, also delighted to be here and, and uh, to see that this Geneva Science and uh, Diplomacy Week is actually happening, and also happy that we managed to uh, contribute from the Geneva Center for Security Policy. Um, yes, emerging technologies are indeed affecting the global balance of power, mainly through uh, military and economic means, and influencing countries' ability to fight and, and to win wars, but also by impacting their economic might. And there is clearly this notion that uh, unlocking the potential of emerging technologies will propel early and successful adopters far ahead of the rest. This technological competition, in particular in the field of artificial intelligence, but increasingly also in other fields such as uh, quantum computing, is, for instance, central to the geopolitical competition between China and the US. And as both countries seek superiority, technological advances in these fields uh, are used as tools for the projection of, of national power. Artificial intelligence stands in particular uh, also to revolutionize warfare in the near future. Armed forces around the globe see artificially enabled autonomy in weapon systems, and integrated integration of AI in various military processes as potentially conferring battlefield advantages to them. This is due to the increased speed and to the accuracy of AI-assisted decision-making. And artificial intelligence is, by the way, already extensively used in intelligence these days, uh, including for surveillance purposes, and in particular also in the war that we are currently witnessing in Ukraine. Perhaps let me make three additional brief points on, on this nexus between uh, uh, science, technology and, and, and security. Artificial intelligence can also be used uh, um, to enable um, some non-traditional security threats. Uh, this is, for example, done through the production of very realistic and extremely targeted disinformation, like for instance deepfake, or fictitious articles, which then can easily uh, spread on social media and can potentially have a, um, massive destabilizing repercussions. Emerging technologies can also give smaller states the ability to have quite uh, uh, unproportional influence on the international stage Specializing in technological niches can allow these states to exert influence, for instance, in conflict and have uh, uh, overproportional geopolitical uh, relevance. Let me uh, cite the example of uh, Turkey and Israel in drone warfare. And, and finally, emerging technologies are also empowering individual and uh, non-state actors. And non-state actors, uh, including terrorist groups and also criminals. Cheap 
and off-the-shelf dual-use technologies are easily available to individuals and non-state actors and uh, allowing them to use them with effects far larger than we had ever imagined. And let me conclude with uh, uh, perhaps uh, a remark on uh, what uh, my centre, the Geneva Centre uh, for Security and Policy does in all of this. Uh, I think we've been at the forefront of the analysis of the impact uh, of emerging te technologies on security and the future of warfare. Uh, we have also participated in a number of international initiatives to improve governance uh, of warfare, such as the uh, uh, group of governmental experts on lethal autonomous weapon systems, and in a number of uh, different diplomatic dialogues on issues uh, pertaining to the future of warfare. Let me, uh, as an example, uh, uh, cite an initiative that we are about to launch, uh, a track two dialogue among P5 states that would look into the growing interface between artificial intelligence, uh, nuclear and biological weapons, and the existential risks that this interface uh, poses. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And we're very grateful that the GCSP has been uh, really active in, in preparing this program and all of these issues that you raised, we're going to be able to experience them uh, in, in this experiential learning uh, opportunity. In the, in the open forum, so we look forward to, to delve uh, into them. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and on that, also security and, and a strategic uh, uh, dimension of science diplomacy, um, I want to invite uh, um, Jovan Kurbalija, who is the, the executive director of Diplo Foundation. Uh, you wrote a, a, a blog that I very much liked a few weeks ago, where you said reality, so it was about science diplomacy. You said reality must be admitted, yet utopia must be so please, Johan, give us your take on past, present, and future of science diplomacy. Well, I may rephrase it. I use utopia. I, 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 I should use it a romantic aspect of, uh, of science. <laughs> and uh, um, that's, that brings me to, the, to, the, to one, one uh, point. But before that, I'm really excited to be to, uh, here, especially in libraries. Uh, it's not as mystic as uh, uh, Foucault's uh, um, Umberto Eco's uh, Foucault's pendulum and not as dangerous, I hope, you check with Francesco, but it's the place where you can reflect. And we have heard from the uh, welcoming speeches this uh, element of anchoring what we do now into the long historical uh, journeys or long durée, uh, and in a way deal with the, what I call it chrononarcism, where we think that everything is happening now and here. People were thinking, reflecting, more or less on similar issues for centuries. And on that point, and in order to answer your question, I will make a quick tour around Geneva, which I suggest our participants in Immersion Week to use this lovely weather outside uh, and to walk to the following places. Let me just, I always bring my compass, uh, my bosola. Uh, I think it is this way, but let me double check. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> You, uh, you go to the following places. You go across the lake to, uh, to that's way, that's east, yes. Across, it doesn't work. <laughs> it's magnetic confusion. You go across the lake and you uh, visit the place where, uh, from outside, where Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein uh, 206 years ago. Why is this important for our era? At that time, she was excited about technological and scientific developments, mainly in Renaissance Italy. And they had long days that was year without sun. And with, uh, with the all the writers, the, she started writing Frankenstein with the following key message, that scientist, Dr. Frankenstein, wanted to create a nice creature by using scientific breakthroughs. And he endowed creature with, uh, with a lot of empathy with the love for humans. But if you, can, if you may recall from the, from the narrative, then when creature went outside the laboratory, people got annoyed because it didn't look like us. Therefore, we became hostile towards creature. And creature reacted then, and then you know the whole narrative. That's the first stop on your journey. Villa Diodati on the other side of lake, thank you, uh, where you can basically see the condensed dilemma of our era. 
And uh, Frankenstein is becoming compulsory reading and, at US AI engineering universities. Then you move a bit towards the old town. Lovely, lovely scenery. You have two interesting personalities. Famous philosopher Rousseau, who to some extent was uh, triggered by technology, not directly, but his writings were especially on education and other tools. And another thinker who came to Geneva in his uh, last uh, phase of his life uh, was Borges, the Australian writer, who wrote a fascinating book of the garden of the forking paths, on the library, of human limitation of, uh, of understanding our reality. Some sort of modesty in what we can do with rationality. Then you, there are many stops, but another is definitely Voltaire, Ferne Voltaire, small village uh, uh, across, across the border, where you can see another great thinker who was also excited by the technology of, the, of his era. But what is the underlying theme? By walking through Geneva, you can see uh, both utopia or romanticism of science that can push the frontiers that through our creativity, we can go a step further. And uh, what some like uh, Russian philosopher Bakunin argued, that God endowed us with potential for creativity. You can push the frontier. That's utopia, which should be preserved. But then you have reality. And reality is that these days, like in the past, science and technology are financed by, to the large extent, defense budgets. Ultimately, internet is, was, was developed with the so-called Sputnik effect, where the West reacted to the launch of the Sputnik. And uh, that's a that's good reminder. And I think this interplay between utopia and reality is crucial for understanding and also understanding what science can and cannot do. We have to avoid, which is sometimes happening, and it doesn't good, do good service to science, to uh, pretend that science is a new religion in sense of providing certainty. All of these thinkers argue that science brings us close to understanding the nature, not to providing certainty in any fields. And if you ask scientists at CERN, they will tell you the same. That element of probability and modesty is extremely important. Therefore, my invitation in this search between utopia and reality is to have this lovely walk towards Villa Diodati, Old Town, Ferne Voltaire, and to think what those people were seeing and how they were reflecting on their reality when they were testing basically the same issue that we are testing now. What are the limits of human rationality and what we can do with our creativity in solving day-to-day -day problems, military, defense, ethical problems of our era? Wow. Thank you so much for this. <laughs> tour that we did a mental tour. Now we're going to do the tour. I hope the participants took good note and, and maybe Julian can uh, draw us a map <laughs> to, to make sure we catch all those uh, sites. I think I have to I hold them. other places, but I will uh, Great, great, great. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Jovan. And since you mentioned CERN, I just want to take the opportunity to, to, to recognize uh, Dr. Archana Sharma, who's here with us here, Archana, who has prepared a wonderful program at CERN on Thursday, and we're going to be uh, also discussing these issues and doing a, a quantum uh, role play negotiation that INSA has prepared. So everything is interconnected, and I love that uh, you're all mentioning each other's topics, and this is how the coalition and, and all the actors really come together and complement each other and bring their strengths and their expertise towards this, uh, this common goal. So the last question is, for uh, Christian Zim from the University of Zurich. And the question is, what is uh, the University of Zurich doing in, in contributing and benefiting from what is the role uh, of a university in general and the University of Zurich in particular in International Geneva? So tell us um, why did you decide to engage in this project? Well, thank you very much. It's, of course, a real challenge after the romantic <laughs> <laughs> part of it and the walk. Uh, maybe you all want to go out and have the walk right now. It was but intentional. It know? was, yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. Speaking after him, it's always tricky, I tell you. <laughs> yeah. But it's always a pleasure, and thank you very much for being all here. I think it's also a sign that you're committed to, to this big question, you know, of, of where do we go with our society? 
we have had various beliefs. You know. uh, a long time ago, it was people that knew everything about the few things that we knew. And then came specialization, and, and then we had this incredible wave, which I, I had also the pleasure to, to live through in Silicon Valley, where you had the impression that technology will basically solve every problem. And it's not exactly true. It doesn't exactly work. And one of the reasons, but you probably have your own, is that in the world science, and in the world even technology, there is one piece missing, and that's all of us, in a way. You, know? you can have the best science. You can have the best technology. And we have many examples over the last two or three years with COVID. And if people don't believe it, if people don't trust it, if people don't use or apply it, nothing happens. Or even worse, it gets even worse than it was before. So in that sense, a university has an important role to play. It, it is one of the few places in the world where you have at the same time the very young people, the, the fresh ones that, that are looking for some guidance, for, for ideas, for for a passion in their life. You have the ones that do the research that will then feed into the teaching. You have the, the teachers, of course, we, which try to transmit their passion, their knowledge to the others. And universities try, I mean, they are not more perfect than other places, but they also try to be a place where you can have sort of neutral reflections, a sort of a space for intellectual experimentation. Sounds big, juicy, but, but, that, but that, that's what it is. You know? and, and, and these places are therefore needed in the world to, to, to come with the ideas, with the solutions, and also the understanding why does evidenced base not necessarily result in a good behavior. And it's in that sense, the University of Zurich, like any other university, has, has more and more realize that it doesn't have only the responsibility of each of the researchers or each of the teachers, but as an institution, it has a role to play in, in, in society. It, we, we, we are citizens of a world made of larger and smaller institutions. And so this is what the university wants to bring in. And of course, a large, very multidisciplinary university like the one in Geneva, but also the one in Zurich, you know, in the same place, you have the quantum specialists and you have the philosophers. You have the historians and you have the lawyers who just go across the building or maybe to another building. And so th th that, that's, I think, what universities and you know, knowledge creation and transmission can bring to it. And that's why the University of Zurich is part of it. Of course, Geneva is the place for diplomacy, but the the three legs, if I can say so, on which Switzerland has been built, you know, the traditions of, um, of humanitarian, uh, humanism, uh, the, the tradition of diplomacy and the tradition of science. Well, science and, and uh, humanism can be anywhere to, to join what you said earlier. <laughs> so, so thank you very much. Thanks, Christian. With these words, I think, of um, encouragement of fostering this multilingual science diplomacy mindset that we are trying to, to foster with this, with this coalition and this program, we will have to end here. Unfortunately, we're a bit late and we still have three closing uh, contributions from uh, another three coalition members. Uh, but I wanted to give, so thank you very much to the four of you for this brief but very insightful uh, uh, inputs, and I'd like to give the last word to Martin if you would like to add something or reflect on anything to close this panel. No, I, thank you, Mark. I don't, I, I don't want to monopolize uh, the flow. I, 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 I just want to say that I was uh, uh, very uh, excited uh, when uh, Jovan talked about utopia and uh, transforming utop utopia in reality. And the city, he's mentioned that uh, what we are saying today has its historical roots in Geneva, that uh, yes, there are people in, in the early days who uh, were utopian in their thinking, but uh, helped us uh, move forward to reality. I think it's a good point there. And the other 
thing I wanted to uh, just highlight it. It's also what you said, Christian, uh, regarding trust in science. I, for one, have always believed that science is one thing that doesn't lie. Science, if applied uh, properly uh, through experimentation and research, produces outcomes that are at best neutral, at worst neutral, I mean, impartial, but uh, I think that it can be a very good basis for uh, decision making. And we, we did see, although they, with the pandemic, uh, the um, uh, people, uh, we, we were so all seduced by the fact that in so short a time, a vaccine was found to cure, to help us uh, overcome the pandemic, although there were lingering doubts about that. But at the end of the day, I think that uh, we are increasingly convinced of the usefulness of that research, scientific uh, research. And of course, one of the things that I saw uh, in the co uh, conversation that we've had here is the, the ethical challenges of uh, scientific innovation. Uh, so I think it was you, uh, uh, Christian, who uh, talked about uh, the fact that uh, maybe the outcome of science is not always uh, uh, put to good use. It could be uh, used for negative purposes. And those are the challenges that uh, we uh, are facing today. Uh, how do we make sure uh, that uh, there are guidelines and uh, regulations that uh, ensure that uh, uh, science and its output can be used for the benefit of mankind and not to destroy mankind? Mm -hmm. I think that's it's, uh, something, and I believe we, we, we need, as we're doing at the IPU, to develop an ethical charter for scientific innovation. Thank you. So that we thank our speakers. Thank you so much. I invite you to move back to Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you to the uh, panelists who have been uh, with us here. And I think as if we were in a, uh, a court of law, we would be saying that uh, we'll invite a number of people to come and issue a rebuttal <laughs> to what has just been said by the uh, previous panelists. But we'd like to hear from uh, uh, Mr. Eve Flokiger. He's here with us. Please uh, join us here. Uh, Peter Glockman, is, has he arrived? Oh, welcome, Peter. <laughs> we, had, we, we had you were stuck somewhere uh, in transit. Thank you for science. And of course, I have my colleague, Nichols uh, Seth, with whom we've been working to put together this uh, 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 week, this Diplomacy Week. So we, you're going to uh, be uh, making, uh, I would say, concluding remarks on the issues that uh, are being uh, raised during this uh, first round table. Thank you, thank you very much. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear participants to this immersive week. It's a real pleasure for me to be uh, with you this afternoon to open this uh, week, very important week for uh, the diplomats, for the universities, and for the dialogue that we want to implement between the two worlds, it's quite important. I think uh, Geneva is the right place to, to do it. I think that um, diplomacy is the art and science of maintaining peaceful relations between nations, groups, and individuals. The Russian military aggression in Ukraine, which adds to so many other conflicts in the world, remind us the fragility of peace and how necessary it is to preserve it. The scientific world is no stranger to what is happening. Faced with the magnitude of this crisis, the University of Geneva is working to preserve exchanges, to preserve dialogue among the international academic community who share the same conviction and conception of scientific freedom and academic integrity, and is a vector of peace in the world. In this context, let me mention briefly that our university has taken some initiative
to help uh, the Ukrainian refugees. Let's take the example of Academic Horizon, which has been put into place into our in university, and also University of Zurich, I think, where we are welcoming more than 300 students coming from Ukraine and other countries around the world. We are also a member of the network Scholaratrisk that allows us to help researchers escaping from, from, from Ukraine. A brief etymological detour reminds us of the connections between diplomacy and science. The term diplomacy itself comes from the ancient Greek, Greek diploma composed of diplo, meaning folded in two, and the suffix ma, meaning an object. The folded docu document gave a privilege, often permit to travel, to the bearer, and the term came to name documents through which princes granted freedom and protection. Going to the academic world, universities deliver a diploma to recognize the successful acquisition and of knowledge and skills by individuals. As much as they need and can benefit from each other, science and diplomacy refer to two distinct social processes and functions. Science, science is about pushing the knowledge frontiers and helping us understand the world around us. Diplomacy and policy making is a social and progress blending not only scientific evidence, but also values, beliefs, and interest towards collective actions. Those distinguished goals can create tension. A recent reminder of that is the recent presentation of IPCC scientists to the Swiss Parliament which was on, only attended by one third of parliamentarians, of Swiss parliamentarians, several of whom actively boycotted this session, claiming they didn't need science to tell them what to do. Overcoming some of the tension, and I think uh, Christian mentioned it very clearly, overcoming some of the tension and barriers between science and policy requires building trust, promoting regular exchanges, understanding what policy and society needs, and understanding what insights science can offer. It is not an easy task because scientists and diplomats have different professional cultures, different functions, and different priorities. Fortunately, scientists and diplomats are not alone to solve their relationship. A new wave of actors are at the interface between science and decision making as they merge to provide support and advice on how to get from scientific knowledge to policy action. For example, the Geneva Science Policy Interface, which was launched in 2018 with many of the universities in Switzerland, be it the Graduate Institute, University of Zurich, EPFL, EPFZ, Institute Geneva, and the League of European Research Universities. This Geneva Science Policy Interface works precisely to promote evidence-based policy making that goes behind one-way transfer of knowledge from science to policy. Its team does that through calls from project and also by supporting an emerging community of individuals and entities that span the boundaries of science and policy around international Geneva ecosystem. Science can also bring new insight into how we use diplomacy and how we understand multilateralism. The lab of, in, on science diplomacy, the seed lab, a joint center of Institute of Geneva and ETHZ is currently developing computational approaches to push the frontiers of diplomacy. This platform, in addition to the role of GESDA in connecting diplomats to future technological developments, draw an attractive picture of Geneva as an ecosystem for science policy and science diplomacy, and as an amplification of the amazing work currently developed in the rest of Switzerland and beyond. I see the Science Diplomacy Week further building this momentum and the understanding around the diverse science diplomacy capacities that we need for now and for the future. I wish you a wonderful stay in Geneva and around Geneva, as uh, Kobalian mentioned it, and a very fruitful week of science diplomacy. And I'm very much looking forward for the concrete result of this week. Thank you very much. Th thank you, Yves. Thank you very much. Uh, for uh, those uh, uh, inspiring comments. Uh, let me now call on uh, Sir Peter Glockman uh, to come to the podium, please. Thank you very much, and it's a delight to see in person at last uh, my friend from 
Jezda, because we've been working by Zoom for a long, long time. This is my first time out of New Zealand in two and a half years, so it's, it's quite an event. Um, the International Science Council is the major track to organisation in the world for science and science diplomacy. It uh, involves some 240 members, which are the national academies, the scientific uh, and, and, and social science uh, discipline uh, uh, unions and associations, and a number of other bodies. It also has a number of affiliate bodies, of which Christian and INSA is one, and underneath that there's the track to organisation of particular interest which is the Foreign Minister's Science and Technology Advisory Network, which is an informal network of science diplomats from about 30, 40 countries, which I chaired for a while, and is now chaired by Nicola Iorno from the, from the, from the Swiss uh, Foreign Ministry. ISC does many things. Tomorrow we will launch here in this building uh, the release of the of a detailed report from involving hundreds of experts on the broader aspects of the COVID pandemic, including particularly the geopolitical and diplomatic considerations that come from the pandemic. Uh, to, the day after that, we'll be meeting with UNHCR over our partnership with them and a number of other organisations regarding uh, the issues out of Ukraine. The ISC's predecessor body, which used to be called ICSU, uh, was key during the Cold War. Some of major science initiatives occurred during the Cold War. The Antarctic Treaty, the commitment of a whole continent to peaceful purposes. The ICSU was the initiator of that by promoting the International Geophysical Year, which led to that. In 1985, it led the Villach Conference, which was the conference of scientists that demanded that the multilateral system set up what became to be known as the IPCC. So the science community won, and the Cold War was critical to maintaining and building relationships between protagonists at a time when there were not other ways to do it. In the last two months, I've been deeply involved in my team in the issues around Ukraine. Should we expel from our membership the Belarusian or the Russian academies because of the issues that their government or their dictator has undertaken? Extensive consultation with many foreign ministries, with many scientific organisations. The unanimous view was we must not because as we go into a period of tension, again, the ability of the ISC as, it's, as a track to organisation and science diplomacy in repairing relationships and allowing the sustainability ag agenda to pick up at uh, speed is critical. But before we go on, let's just say a little bit about what is science diplomacy. I fear that we talk the word without what, thinking about what it is. In my mind, it's about using science to achieve diplomatic goals. Often science international science cooperation is to achieve scientific goals. But here we're talking about achieving diplomatic goals. And that might be for the direct interests of a country, for instance, projecting soft power, or achieving influence, or promoting trade, or achieving technology, achieving security, many reasons. Or it might be for bilateral issues. The longest trade war in history was between New Zealand and Australia, 84 years. It existed because we were, Australia didn't want our apples because they claimed that they had a fruit fly in them, which they didn't. It took the science to point out that we could use DNA to show there was no fruit flies in New Zealand for the Australian Prime Minister to finally eat a New Zealand apple on television. And of course, what we're focusing on and what many of the speakers have been focusing on here is the sustainability agenda, the issues of the global commons. And I think within that, we must focus on some particular issues. The first is, and what JESTA is doing so well and being just a remarkable resource for all of us to use, is its technology radar. What is new technologies going to deliver? 
what, what are the issues which diplomats have to focus on. We obviously have to think about global regulation, and clearly that is in a very difficult place given the various geopolitical poles that are emerging. I point out that even now, I don't know how many decades on, we still do not have a scientific background, backbone, to the Convention on Biological Warfare. And yet, if you think back over the last few years, last two and a half years, what, that we don't have a convention about anthropogenic biological uh, accidents or intention is a great concern. Progress on dealing with autonomous weapons, AI-driven weapons, as one of you spoke about before, is not in existence. Even getting a new pandemic treaty two and a half years in, we're only sorting out who might be chair of the committee to discuss whether the international health regulations should be reformed, let alone getting on and doing it. So there's many things to do there. But when we think about diplomacy between governments, we must also think about diplomacy with citizens, because governments and citizens are intimately related. And one of the things which Stefan and others know I'm on about in our conversations at JESDA is let's not forget about the societal response to the technologies as well as we think about the diplomatic considerations. And there are deep issues, and I won't dwell on them, but one of the things in my own research, I run a centre for informed futures in New Zealand, that we're involved in with a country, and I won't name which, is thinking about what happens if in this digital and metaverse-driven world, the loyalty of citizens shifts from the nation state to a virtual entity. There's already one virtual country in the world, which has no, country, which has no land. Any of the 100 countries recognise us as having passports. The, Order of Malta, I can't, uh, it's not the quite name, but, but it's the Maltese order, which, two, which has 100 countries recognising its passports, yet it has no land. So the idea of virtual loyalties is not impossible. But what COVID has also shown, and sadly what Ukraine is showing as well, is that the Multilateral system is not up to speed. We're clearly at a point where the world needs a more effective multilateral system in multiple ways. It's been inchoate in relationship to the COVID pandemic. Uh, it's been not clear that there's been effective input in the right way into issues across the sustainability agenda. Every analysis, whether done by the Global Sustainability Development Report or any of the other organisations, SDSN led by Jeffrey Sachs, they all come to the same conclusion, we are failing on the sustainability agenda. One of the major reasons we're failing on the sustainability agenda is because science and policy are still disconnected in so many countries. And part of it is critical. Most foreign ministries do not have good connections with their science communities. Because at the UN, whether it's the UN in New York or in any of the other agencies, ultimately it's largely diplomats that are there representing the member states. And as myself and the UN Secretary General's office have been repeatedly talking about, and I've been talking about at the High Level Political Forum last year and again at the STI Forum earlier this year, if the member states do not have science linked to their foreign ministries, how can we forget, expect, expect the multilateral system to have the right inputs into what goes on? But beyond that, just as in domestic policy, there's not an area, I would argue, where science cannot inform policy making. The same is true in the multilateral space. And so the International Science Council is leading discussions within the UN system on how to strengthen science advice into the UN system, scientific input. Because I think what we need to do is distinguish the input that comes within government systems from the vast knowledge that the scientific community has. And what we're trying to do is work with, this, with the UN system to see how that knowledge becomes more accessible into the science system. I want to finish there by just congratulating the insights of those who came up with the idea of JESDA. JESDA is something that allows a mechanism 
particularly the technology radar, which we can use as a reference point for the many other things that organisations like mine and, and academic can use. And I think the way that it's being approached by the team remains that it will be a remarkable resource. But the most important thing is let's hold hands together. And I like the fact that we've been working with Jester. There are many organisations associated with this particular event. INGSA uh, is, uh, is very involved, for example. Because I think if we cannot unite within the Track 2 community, we don't have much hope of influencing the Track 1 community. And the role of the ISC in particular is to try and unite that Track 2 community. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Peter. Using science to achieve diplomatic goals. And I, I would be tempted to add goals that are beneficial to society and to mankind, because science can also be used uh, to achieve diplomatic goals that are negative for mankind. So thank you very much. I, I believe you were talking about the benefits to mankind and society. Thank you. I now have a great pleasure in inviting my colleague, uh, uh, Nikhil uh, Seth, uh, Executive Director of UNITA. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's always a challenge to be the last speaker deep in the afternoon where the co-chairs are looking at me and saying that hurry up with your show so that we can get to the last part of this program. But I'll try my best to engage you because I've been asked to unpack some of the things uh, that are contained in the kinds of issues we're looking at today. Uh, what is public policy? Is it just diplomatic, national diplomatic policy to achieve national ends? Or there's something called the global good for which we in multilateralism have been struggling for so many years and decades. And I will take the more generous interpretation that Martin gave, uh, which is the latter, of looking at how to imbue global policy uh, with a greater intelligence by using science diplomacy. So uh, we haven't done very well in making good global policy decisions and the wreckage of the bad decisions that we've taken over the past so many uh, decades are evident before us. And this is not only in issues of war and peace, what we call the pillar of peace and security in the UN, or in the area of sustainable development, which includes things like climate change, biodiversity loss, and so much more, also in the area of human rights. Our performance has been pretty bad. So if we can lay the blame to a large extent on the failure of good global policy, good global policy to pursue the global good, then what is it that we need to do differently to get global policy right? And here, let me start by summarizing my own understanding of what global policy is. I've had the fortune of spending years, in fact decades, in multilateral processes, Security Council, General Assembly, Economic and Social Council, the spring meetings of the Bank and Fund. Uh, and these are not all, but these are parts of the so-called global policy making uh, uh, places. Some of them are universal, some of them are more limited membership decision-making. To these, I'd add decisions that are made in the European Union, in the African Union, uh, the different regional banks. There's so many processes. And then what is global policy, actually? It's probably the aggregation of the declarations, the resolutions, the platforms of actions that are adopted every year by these multiple, multiple bodies. Uh, of course, they're not all the same. What may be said by the General Assembly will sometimes be at great variance with what is said in the spring meetings of the Bank and Fund. But despite their dissimilarities, if you aggregate all this together, then that body of common understandings is probably, uh, we can put the words, global policy making. And they've often been divisive. And uh, what we have today is an amalgam of like-minded, small, multilateral groups against the more diffused, larger, universal groups. So that is how I understand global policy. And the global policy that I have seen uh, being made, I would say 
That is the absence of science, which is probably the common characteristic in all these bodies, rather than science being a force to help make intelligent decisions. And this is not science in the way sometimes science is understood. This is also the whole area of data, uh, the whole area of the scientific method, and also the evidence from science. Now, these are all very uh, uh, you know, evident in some areas of global policy making. Uh, many people have talked about environmental issues, climate change, biodiversity loss, and so on. Uh, they're more apparent in issues like that. But there are many other areas that we make global policy on where they are not that apparent, including on largely political issues, poli uh, issues of peace and security, where, again, uh, the force of science has been very weak. The loss of human life and destruction of civilian infrastructure that can hardly be given a scientific weight to. But you also have issues like gender equality and empowerment, the whole issue of sexual preferences. All these cannot be treated in the way we treat the evidence that comes from science in some of the issues we're more familiar with. So we need to have a little more nuanced discussion on what does science mean, what are the areas that science can influence policy, and what are the areas in which science cannot influence policy. So we have a global policy process. Many of them are at the summit level. You have presidents and prime ministers going to meetings like the G7 and G20 and so on. Uh, and others, you have younger diplomats who go and pass resolutions in the General Assembly, which are not heard of once the ink has dried on those resolutions. But you remain and remember what comes out of the G20, the G7, and other such big meetings which track presidents and prime ministers. Now, what can we do to change the nature of these decisions that are being made, including in the Security Council? And one thing we all should realize, that these decisions are not made on the spur of the moment by these presidents and prime ministers. There's a whole preparatory process. Many of them, uh, they're called the Sherpas often, and these Sherpas are normally diplomats, senior diplomats, depending on the process, sometimes junior diplomats. How do we train these junior diplomats and these people who are the Sherpas to come up with more intelligent draft outcomes for their presidents and prime ministers to adopt? So that's the first challenge we face. Uh, the second is how do we get in our crisis-driven world to get people to focus on more long-term issues? I mean, the conflict in Ukraine has obviously captured every intergovernmental body. There are a lot of histronics around these intergovernmental bodies. But is that doing a service or a disservice to public policy making processes? So we've got to be intelligent in seeing how do we use uh, you know, these processes to imbue with them that the, what we need to imbue them with to get more intelligent decision making. So tri uh, getting long-term agendas, it's not as if we'll have standalone meetings on anticipatory science uh, at the G20 or the G7, but we've got to learn to work with their current agendas. They might be crisis-driven, but we've got to live with that. that. They have certain agendas they've drawn up, in our contemporaneous world, which is driven by crisis, but how do we bring in the science in their current agendas? And of course, there are several other uh, processes where it's much easier, but I think we need to look at more uh, systematic and scientific ways of bringing this learning of science, the scientific method, scientific approaches, and using data. I give one example that my organization is very happy to uh, contribute, with, with which we are very happy to contribute. It's satellite imagery analysis and global information systems and the wealth of data and information that provides for more intelligent policy making. Uh, we've been working in conflict situations. We did something called crater analysis in Syria to show whether the cessation of hostilities is holding or not. We do daily analysis of the kind of images that are coming out of Ukraine to see what is the loss and damage being caused every day. We look at movements of people, we look at migration, we look at the conditions in refugee camps, uh, we look at flood water, artificial intelligence to predict flood water. Uh, we look at ways in which we can look at coastal zone erosion. We can look at so many other aspects of the environment. So these has applications in every kind of humanitarian human situation. And how do we bring these images? And these are 
intertemporal images. We have images of the same spot on Earth for the last 25 years. And what these compared images can do for a policymaker is much more than a million word dispatch that is written for that policymaker. So how do we bring these kinds of tools for policymakers to make better decisions? So that's what I wanted to say. We are not using our tools. We are not using the type of diplomatic training we need to do. And I'm very happy that JESTA and Switzerland and this ecosystem in Switzerland is going to enable us uh, to be able to do this with our global policy making processes. We are also in a very fortunate position where Switzerland will soon be on the Security Council starting 1st January of 2023. So that's an opportunity because when you are the president of the Security Council, you have the opportunity to take initiatives of to bring in agenda items onto the Security Council. And wouldn't it be lovely if one of those agenda items could focus on anticipatory science and its application for all the pillars of the United Nations? whether it's peace and security or sustainable development or human rights. I think that would be a great initiative. So one has to grab every opportunity. The neglect of the past has to go. We know it. We've not been making intelligent uh, policy over the last so many years. How do we make that change? What are the incremental steps we have to take? And what can this wonderful infrastructure and ecosystem of Geneva, how can that change global policy? Switzerland may sometimes feel that they may not be on the main decision tables in G20 or G7, but there's a way of influencing each one of these processes where that change will come. So I end with that and the need for us to be more rational in the way we approach these issues on the realization that we need to take baby steps, but practical steps which will make a difference. And I also end with thanking Jezda for bringing us all here together, thank you. And uh, it's wonderful to hear uh, so many other people who've been on policy making tables and who probably share some of the things I've said on the lack of our global policy processes. Uh, it's often politics that has informed science in the political processes that I'm familiar with rather than science informing political processes and policy. And I hope we will make that difference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nikhil. Uh, you said that it is uh, high time uh, global policy was made right. And uh, science has the potential to make us uh, get our uh, poli uh, global policy act uh, right. Um, point. Um, we have now come to the end of uh, this introductory segment of the uh, Science Diplomacy Week, the Maiden Science Diplomacy Week. And it has been a pleasure for me and uh, my uh, co-host, uh, Marga, to uh, steer the deliberations of today. And uh, we have listened uh, with a lot of keen interest to uh, the comments that have come from the eminent uh, panelists uh, that have been here with us today. Uh, my notes uh, told me that I should be say that uh, we are in the beginning of a dialogue between science and uh, policy makers. I should say that in spite of the relative novelty of science and uh, science diplomacy, I think it's barely 10 years old, there's a lot that we can build on. There is a solid foundation for uh, science and policy making. Uh, to meet, and uh, there has, as the scientific community is very expert at doing, they have been able to provide the evidence that shows that science needs to be at the table. We have all talked about multilateralism, the failings of multilateralism in the face of uh, current challenges and even future challenges, and we do think that it is not multilateralism as such that is at stake. It is the uh, practices and actors of multilateralism that we may want to look at and see how we can review the way they do business for the better. 
Um, when we look at multilateralism today, it hasn't evolved very much from 1945 when the United Nations was created. A lot of stakeholders have come to the fore. At the time, multilateralism was designed as an interaction between governments, between states, but since then, we've had a host of other stakeholders that have come onto the scene, and we ignore these stakeholders at our own risk and peril. One of those stakeholders is the scientific community, and it has been proven that science, as we say, politically neutral. You mentioned, Eve, uh, the fact that uh, there was this briefing in the Swiss parliament and there was very little interest, and there was even hostility uh, towards the scientific community, but I think that uh, gradually, there is a great awareness that science has the potential to help us in decision-making, beneficial uh, decision-making. And it is important, people may ask why the Interparliamentary Union, the Global Organization of Parliaments, is here. What, what do legislators have to do with science? Two things. Legislators can gain from the evidence provided by scientific research and innovation to make what Nickel said, intelligent policy, intelligent decisions. That is what is needed. Too often, uh, legislators rely on political and sometimes emotional considerations to make decisions. It is high time we began to reap the benefits of science, especially politically neutral science. And then we think that it is a two-way street in the sense that legislators have the power to make laws, to provide budgetary resources, to set guidelines and policies for the development of science and technology. So it is important that these two communities be talking to each other to make sure that they understand each, the stake that they have in collaborating. I also think and believe fundamentally in dialogue, and science can be a foundation for that dialogue with a view to peace. When the founding fathers of the IPU created the organization in 1889, they talked about dialogue. But I think at the time they were talking of dialogue between parliamentarians with a view to achieving peace. They were not talking of other stakeholders such as science, uh, such as civil society. And I haven't heard us talk a lot about the private sector that have to be at the table too. But today, if they were to come out of their graves, they would agree with us all that it is important that uh, we begin to uh, talk to the uh, uh, scientific community. And that is why we at the IPU want to build on the unifying uh, benefits, advantages of science, and that is why we admire the CERN model, Dr. Sharma. We're very keen to show that science can unify people, and I'm glad that uh, you're going to go to CERN to see their business model, where people whose countries may be at war, conflict at each other's throats, are working together because they believe in the uh, benefits of uh, science as a tool for peacemaking. That is why the Interparliamentary Union has been able to establish a dedicated body, the Working Group on Science and Technology, to harness the benefits of science for decision making, not only for the institution that I represent, a multilateral institution, but for each of its individual members. How can we help individual parliaments reap the benefits of scientific innovation in order to better take decisions? How can individual parliaments create a conducive environment for scientific innovation? Because we'll need this to continue to address new and emerging challenges. So uh, we come to this from a point of view that uh, it is important, it is critical that the two communities, the policy-making community and the scientific community come together for the benefit of mankind. So I feel confident during this 
week that we will continue to gather further evidence to support this argument and that you, the uh, participants, can help us create that curriculum. Of course, the curriculum will not be a one-size-fits-all curriculum. There will be differentiated uh, 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 approaches within that uh, curriculum, but it will help us to begin to structure to conversation between the uh, scientific and policy-making communities. And we hope that in the long term, as uh, is in the concept note for this uh, uh, piece, uh, uh, this uh, scientific science diplomacy week, we can build a community of multilingual professionals who are versed not only in science, but also in what science can bring to diplomacy, to uh, decision making, and to multilateralism at large. So it has been a pleasure for me to be with you, with Marga. And uh, we look forward to what we see to be an exciting uh, week. And uh, I conclude by thanking each and every one of you who has taken the floor here to uh, shed light on this, I would say, uh, relatively new and vague notion of science diplomacy. And uh, I can be sure that at the end of the week, we'll have a fuller and more useful picture of what we are talking about. And we can use that to move forward. So without further ado, let me, I know we're running late, uh, Marga. We can invite uh, the uh, speakers, those who have uh, spoken here for a photo opportunity at the stage here before we adjourn for this. Thank you very much.